Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Greetings and welcome to this week's Where Did the Road Go? Tonight we're going to be talking with Robert W. Sullivan IV. And uh, he's been on a couple of times before. We had him on initially for his Cinema Symbolism 1, A Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. We've also had him on for his book, The Royal Arch of Enoch, The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism. He has a new book out called Cinema Symbolism 2, and uh, that's what we're going to be dealing with tonight. And uh, Robert's a philosopher, historian, antiquarian, jurist, lay theologian, writer, mystic, showman, radio, TV personality, best-selling author, and lawyer. And uh, he's, he's got some really interesting stuff we're going to get into tonight. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, th- we did do an extra Patreon segment dealing with Spaghetti Westerns. And so those of you who are patrons, you'll get that later in the week. You can become a patron at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And uh, really, that's where you can find everything, full archives and book reviews and videos and all kinds of stuff. So all our social media is connected there. Everything Where the Road Go related is there. And I want to thank everyone who has helped up to this point, all of the patrons, because you're all awesome. And uh, we do do the occasional Ask Us Anything for patrons, and we answer their questions in patron-only shows. And uh, you get shows in advance, especially if they're multi-part episodes, and you get extra bits on almost every interview. Not quite, but most of them. So uh, for $3 a month, you get quite a bit, I think. And this week, you'll get an extra segment from Robert. I also have a Q&A with Travis I'm going to be putting up um, from the Travis premiere for patrons as well. All right, with no further ado, here's my conversation with Robert. Hey there, Robert. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Soraya. Uh, it's great to be back on Where Did the Road Go? Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to be with you tonight. Um, and you have, you have a new book called Cinema Symbolism 2. That's correct. When did uh, this, this come is, out? The, the print edition came out a little over two months ago. The ebook was released about 10 days ago. Okay. All right. So it's basically everywhere is what you're saying. Correct. You can get it on it's Cinema Symbolism 2. It's the number two. Uh, it's on all the major online retailers such as Amazon.com, Books a Million. It's on the ebook sites, you know, Kindle, ebook mall, Kobo, Bookshout. Um, it is on Barnes and Noble, but the last time I checked, Barnes and Noble's website was completely down. Um, <laughs> but it is the, it is there. Um, you know, I guess whenever they get the site back up. Um, but no, it's on. It's available on all the main, le- you know, online retailers. You get the print edition, the ebook, no problem. Okay, and uh, did you put this out yourself? Yes, I put. I did. Uh, this is now. I'm now doing. Um, I'm now. I formulated my own publishing company called Deadwood Publishing. Mm. Uh, that sort of has a bit of a double meaning. Uh, Deadwood on HBO was my favorite television show. Was one of them. And of course, you you often hear books referred to as the Deadwood edition because mm. you know it was the paper from the trees, of course. So yeah, I, I formulated my own uh, publishing company. I'm doing it myself. Royal Arch of Enoch and my first two books, Royal Arch of Enoch and Cinema Symbolism have been republished as second editions through my new publishing house. They're available also everywhere in the print edition and the ebook. And uh, yes, Cinema Symbolism 2 was uh, released through Deadwood Publishing. Yeah, and I think I'd be very disappointed if you had a, a publishing company that didn't have some kind of double meaning behind the name. You know, thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> there is. Um, it's actually funny you mentioned this. I don't want to give too much away, but in, in the introduction of Cinema Symbolism 2, I, I actually talk about some hidden things that are some hidden codes in some of my books. Uh, I don't want to give it too much away. person can read it and make their own mind about it. Right, right. Okay. Um, so in this book, uh, well, one of the, the interesting ones, I, I'm going to hit some of the movies I know because some of these, as, as much as people are probably going to cringe out there, I've never seen the Harry Potter films. I'm not, I've never been interested in them. I don't like the fantasy type of stuff. I know they're, you know, no disrespect to anyone who likes them. They just have never interested me. Um, but I, I definitely want to you, you talk about the occult casting of Max von Sydow in Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, this is something that I picked up in the first book. 
Um, you know, we talk about esoteric symbolism in film, and and it's it's unique um, this this phenomenon where a, a movie maker or a producer will actually cast someone for occult purposes, um, and they're doing this to sort of draw in on a subconscious level these cultural valences that this actor or actress uh, brings to this film from other movies. It's 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 it goes well beyond typecasting. Uh, I first noticed this. I'll get to Von Cito in a minute. Okay. I first noticed this just quickly in in, in cinema symbolism um, with in, in the first book I wrote with with the Matrix movie um, in the sequel uh, the Matrix Reloaded uh, the the casting of the of the actor Anthony Zerbe is actually esoteric in nature and it, it actually reflects back to a movie that he made called uh, the Omega Man with Charlton Heston mm, and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll let people re- read the book but but his 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 casting in the matrix actually ties into that earlier role and, and this is exactly the the the, the purpose for von Cito, although in a different context if, if you've watched um episode seven and i just say off the bat I, I thought episode seven was a pretty good movie i mean i know it treads on episode four um you know you can always call it almost a remake of it in certain aspects but right. overall i like the movie um, so did I, I. I did yeah, I did enjoy episode seven uh, for sur- for certain. Uh, I, I was watching it uh, several times, and the the movie definitely has what I would call I, I wouldn't go so far as to list it as a Gnostic film in the vein of something like The Matrix or The Truman Show or Fight Club, but it definitely flirts with it. But anyway, getting back to Von Cito, I'm watching the movie over and over again, and I'm, I it just kind of sat in my head like a splinter. Why why is Von Cito in the in, in this movie for this very brief brief introduction? And it's it's you know an actor they you know they could have pretty much cast a- anybody in this thing, um, you know if you've seen the movie he's only there for a very little bit and of course it takes place on this desert planet and and he gives uh, the one guy the little sacred relic the Luke, the map of Luke Skywalker and then Kylo Ren lands he confronts Kylo Ren who is the sort of quasi Sith Lord the, the heir apparent I guess to Darth Vader and he strikes him down of course and and I just kept watching this over and over and it just wasn't right to me and I, I just couldn't help but kept thinking to myself, you know, wh- wh- why is Von Cito in here? And it just one day hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like a, you know, lightning strike. Um, what the filmmakers are actually doing by casting Von Cito is they're actually drawing upon two uh, earlier films that Von Cito was in. And they really harken back to me. I'm like, where, where have I seen this all before? And it's two other movies. You know, where, where have I seen uh, um, uh, a Max Von Cito character play this hermit figure? confront a dark evil lord in the desert and of course it's the opening of the exorcist mm. where von Cito as father marin is walking through the desert and confronts the statue of pazuzu and of course that sets up the exorcist and there was another movie called dune where um, von Cito plays a hermit hermit type figure named is dr keens and he confronts a dark evil lord on a desert planet uh known as arrakis um he confronts a dark evil lord known as baron harkonnen who also strikes him down and um, really what that opening sequence in episode seven is doing by casting Von Cito, it's, it's very esoteric in nature. It's actually conjuring. It's, it's playing on your subconscious mind. It, it really is the closest thing I can think of to what I would call cinematic sorcery. It's conjuring to your subconscious mind these earlier movies that Von Cito made. And in doing so, it's investing the first order, this Kylo Ren figure with sort of the demonism of Pazuzu and the butchery and savagery of the Harkonnens. It's very adroit. It's very subliminal. It's, and it's very well done. Um, and like I said, I've, I've, I, when I first started documenting this, I thought this was a very rare phenomenon with, with, von, with uh, excuse me, with Zerbi in, in The Matrix Reloaded. Um, I found it with Von Cito and I found it with some um, other actors and, 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 and other films. And I, I know we were talking off air yeah, you know, we don't have to get to it just this minute, but um, Lost Highway by Lynch does the same trick, by the way, um, and it's it's a very it's a very unique phenomenon. But but yes, the the casting of Max von Sydow is very occult in nature, and you know we talk about symbols in movies. The actors and actresses can also uh, serve as an occult symbol, drawing forth these cultural valences that they bring from other movies. It's it's a really interesting study. Hmm. Did Did you find anything like that in the uh, in the Rogue One film? You know, I haven't seen Rogue One yet. Oh, uh, so so I, ha- I haven't seen it, but I look forward to watching it. And it's 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 like I said, it's it's something at first that I thought was somewhat um, rare. I, I but now I see it a little bit more and more. 
Um, but I, I have seen it in other movies. I've seen it in The Matrix Reloaded with, with Zerby, and I saw it in the um, uh, with Episode 7 with Von Cito. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon. It's not in every movie, of course, but it does turn up from time to time. Huh. Well, let's, let's get into Lost Highway. Now, I haven't seen Lost Highway in a while, and I was always kind of torn on whether I liked it or not. Because uh, clearly you kind of get to the end and you're like, what, what did I just watch? Absolutely. It, it's confusing intentionally. Um, in, in Cinema Symbolism 2, I have a whole chapter on four David Lynch movies. I, I wanted to take on more, but I, I stuck to uh, Blue Velvet, Dune, Lost Highway, and Mulholland Drive. And the last two, Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive, are almost sort of similar movies. They parallel each other remarkably. Lost Highway is one of those movies where Lynch intentionally is obscuring it. You, you really can't figure it out for certain. Um, you know, you know it, it's just one of those movies where you really, you know, even if, if you watch it, I mean, it, it, there's really no literal or symbolic interpretation to it. It's almost next to impossible to figure out. I, I clearly believe Lynch wants it that way. What, what the movie ultimately boils down to, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's mirroring negative theology. Um, it's, it's Gnostic in nature. It, it's, it's, the, it's negative theology. This was um, practiced or, or was the theology of a group of Gnostics known as the Sethians. Um, and and what, what negative theology sort of holds is that by not being like God or not being like divinity, you actually can become closer to divinity. Um, it's a negation. Uh, this, this theology is complex. Uh, the, the Sethians were a group of Gnostics who sort of preached this. Uh, this, this. This theology was codified in the 5th century by a writer who used a pseudonym um, of the name of Dionysus the pseudo uh, yeah. And this was later Christianized in the Middle Ages by St. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas. And what you have going on in Lost Highway is the Fred Madison character, the Bill Pullman character. Um, I mean, he's really the jerk. He's paranoid. He, you know, is is controlling. He's a complete control freak. I mean, he has he even has to live near an observatory um, because he's so controlling. Um, and and the idea is that he he becomes so, so controlling that he actually winds up in a situation where he can't control anything. He winds up in jail. And this is where he actually receives enlightenment, where he becomes another person named, um, uh, what's the other character's name? It's um, Pete, Pete, Pete Layton, I think it is, or Dayton. And, uh, you know, he's the, Dayton is the polar opposite of Fred. Um, he's relaxed, he's laid back, he's not paranoid, he's willing to open himself to new experiences. So you have this whole negative theology concept going on in that with the whole idea of, um, the, the, the farther, you know, the, 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 the more paranoid um, and, and the more, you know, uh, control freakish he is, this is the Bill Pullman character, he actually liberates himself. Um, and in a, state, in a state of in jail, in a state of nothingness, in a state of total stasis, he actually becomes this other character um, where he's liberated, um, where he's completely free. So it's the idea of the more negative you become, the actual liberation of your soul is, is, uh, occurs. Again, it's what's known as negative theology. Um, we just talked about occult casting, yeah. um, and, you, and you have this going on in this movie as well. This is something else going on in here, is the casting of Bill Pullman and Robert Loggia. Um, Lost Highway was released in, in, in February of 1997, um, and if you think back, um, if you've watched Lost Highway, you will know that the Robert Loggia character and the Bill Pullman character are complete maniacal maniacs. I mean, they're very evil. Um, they're very mean spirited. I mean, the Bill Pullman character um, goes to prison for murdering the the Renee character, uh, which is Patricia Arquette. Uh, the Robert Loggia character turns up in in the in the other sequence with uh, Pete Dayton, and and he 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 sort of the, the Robert Loggia character sort of sort of incarnates as the um, Fred Madison character in Pete Dayton's world, um, and it's 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 you have Loggia and. Uh, Pullman as these two total jerks. Scumbags is really the word I'm looking for. And I was sitting there watching it, and um, I, you know, it occurred to me that you know, just it was a few months earlier that you had Robert Loggia and, and Bill Pullman in the summer of 1996 um, saving the world um, from uh, a group of uh, fascist space aliens in Independence Day. Mm. Uh, you, had, you had Pullman playing the heroic president, 
and you had Loge as his sort of stoic, um, you know, George S. Patton general there. And they were the saviors. They were the saviors of Earth, planet Earth from these evil space aliens. So by Lynch really turning around all of a sudden uh, and casting them as two scumbags in Lost Highway, what, what he's essentially doing is giving the symbolic middle finger to the summer blockbuster. <laughs> um, and it, it's uh, no surprise because Lynch has often talked about his disdain for Hollywood popcorn movies, how he thinks they're total crap. So by casting uh, a few months later, Loja and Pullman as two scumbags, he, he's essentially giving the middle finger to the Hollywood blockbuster. It, it's an interesting movie. Um, I, I like the whole idea. I'll just wrap up on this. Of, of course, I, I, I couldn't escape this without mentioning the Robert Blake character of the mystery man. Um, sort of the idea of evil being omnipresent everywhere. But it's, it's also the idea, and this, this draws forward on, an, on another um, sort of ancient theology coming out of something known as the Book of Enoch. Um, and th this is something I really studied when I wrote my first book called The Royal Arch of Enoch. As you have going on inside the Book of Enoch is this whole idea of, of um, what I would call divine evil. Um, and what I mean by that is, you have Enoch, you know, interacting with these group of fallen angels, fallen angels in, um, in, in, in the book of Enoch, and he gets this divine wisdom from them. And it's the sort of same thing with the mystery main character. He's evil. He's on the present. He only goes where he's invited. You know, of course, evil always does. Um, but it's, it's, it's ultimately the evil winds up bringing enlightenment um, to, to uh, Fred Madison because it allows him to become the Pete Dayton character. Unfortunately, the evil, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where just, you know, the Loja character really, you know, sort of personifies the Madison character in the in the Dayton storyline. And the ultimate moral of the story is that um, Dayton, Madison, no matter how hard they try, can't escape their former selves. And of course, Dayton reverts back to Madison at the end. And, and that's sort of the moral of the story, I suppose, is he's driving on this lost highway, not knowing who he is or where he's going. Um, it's an interesting movie. Um, you can interpret it many ways. I mean, I think that kind of pins it down, but it's it's definitely you know a confusing movie. You you won't be able to watch it more than once and say, okay, that's definitively the answer. But you certainly have these Enochian um, themes in it, and this whole idea of negative theology, which is really coming from a group called the Sethian, the Sethians, which was this early Gnostic sect running around in the second and third century. Wow. Okay. I, I, you know, I mean, it doesn't surprise me at all that Lynch would stick something like that in his films. Um, but do you think all of this stuff on all these, uh, on all these films are as intentional or just kind of, it just kind of happens that way? Sure. It's a good question. I think in some cases it's intentional. Um, I know that for a fact because some of it's too well placed. I, I think in some instances it could be coincidence, but I, I'm not really as a lawyer. I don't really believe in coincidences. <laughs> I, I think, I think in, I think in some aspects. Um, when, when you're dealing with certain things, like I mean, well, I'm constantly asked about 9-11 turning up in, in, in movies pr prior to the actual incident. Movies that go back 20, 30 years, 15 years before the incident, I mean, that, that's too far removed. But you do have some interesting 9-11 references right before the actual incident. Um, and, you know, to, that to me isn't a coincidence, but I do have a hard time to believe that movie makers had pre-knowledge of this. So what, what, what I propose in my book, and, and this is really the only thing I... I come up with is I say in, in my book that when, you know, when you're dealing with these movies as a creative expression of mankind, you're dealing with what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. Um, and it's this whole idea of these archetypal images and, and themes and ancient religion and excuse me, ancient religions and symbols, all part of the human experience. So as cinema, as this artistic expression, these, so in some cases, these um, themes and symbols and icons turn up regardless of the filmmaker's intent. And, and Young, for starters, Young, and Young argued that this was inherited, that it's inherited to all human beings. And I, I tend to agree with him. Um, and I'll just add real quickly that this comes um, from the Greek philosopher Plato. He, he, he proposed the same thing. He called it the theory of forms. Young called it the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. And what I propose in my book is, okay, well, if, if it's inherited, could it also somehow be predictive? Um, so, you know, is it in a film? So when you, you have a film where it's, you know, right before nine 11, where it's clearly, you know, I think to like the, the matrix movie with Neil Anderson's passport expiring right. on nine 11 one, there's some interesting symbolism going on in the Patriot movie with Mel Gibson, which was released about 15 months before nine 11. Um, 
you know, I, I say that, you know, I find it a hard to believe that Mel Gibson or Roland Emmerich, you know, or the Wachowskis had sort of forewarning of 9-11. That to me seems kind of far-fetched. Nevertheless, you find this imagery in the films. So what I propose in, in the book is um, that perhaps the collective unconscious, it's the whole idea of movies being prophetic. And is, is, is the collective unconscious also somehow predictive? Um, it's an interesting theory. I, I put it forward. I agree with, I mean, I, I don't dispute that it's controversial, but I, I just have a hard time believing that the Wachowskis, you know, had forewarning of 9-11. So, I, I, you know, you take a movie like The Matrix, which has loads of intentional symbolism. Could this have somehow snuck in there as some sort of co a collective unconscious mechanism that is predictive? Um, that's what I at least propose in, in that instance. And again, it's, it's, um, it's context. You know, in some instances, I know this material is completely intentional. So it's the context of what it's presented. But when you get into things like 9-11, I, I propose that in, in certain aspects, it could be uh, certainly the uh, collective unconscious working as a predictive mechanism instead of just being inherited. Hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we actually just talked recently about uh, some of the ways that fiction has influenced, um, you know, reality and stuff. And we, were, we had talked briefly about the the moon on Saturn that looks just like the death star, you know, oh, I have it. I have, I'm not familiar with that, but that's interesting. Yeah. It has a, uh, a line around it just and a, and a huge crater right where the, 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 uh, the gun was on the death star. And, uh, Richard Hoagland had, you know, suggested that Lucas had foreknowledge of this and that's why he made the death star like that. But I think I, I, I kind of present, presented in the same way you did that this is something you know collective unconscious sort of thing like we may know more than we realize we know right exactly that, that's exactly the way i see it as well um i mean i i i i mean it's really the one that's really interesting is you have the whole thing going on in the matrix with 9 11 are you familiar with the one in the patriot that's really no. fantastic oh th this is one of this is by far and away you know one of the real hardcore ones um, you know, you had the whole thing going on earlier in the year with uh, the lone gunman, you know, with the pilot, with the Paris, uh, you know, uh, abducting or, you know, hijacking the airplane and flying into the World Trade Center. In the Patriot movie, you, you, it's at the very beginning of the movie, the Mel Gibson character it plays, takes place during revolutionary times. You know, it's like 1775 is when it opens. And Mel Gibson is, this is during the opening credits, he's in his barn and he's making a chair. He's making a wooden chair. And, uh, he, he, he says uh, the chair weighs, and he weighs it, and the chair weighs exactly 9 pounds, 11 ounces. Mm. And then he takes it off the scale and sits on it, and it comes crashing down. Um, and I, I thought that was really, really just interesting symbolism. I mean, you know, just, just the, you know, 9 pounds, 11 ounces, and he sits on it, and the chair crashes. Right. Uh, I, just, I just thought that was really fascinating. But I'm with you. I mean, I don't think Mel Gibson or Roland Emmerich, you know, had some sort of forewarning of this. I just think it's like you said, it's the collective unconscious, and perhaps we know more than we know and it's in this case serving as some sort of predictive predictive mechanism is is what i would argue and I, and i think certain events too probably send ripples through that collective unconscious even from the future i agree i, I definitely think that's ve very possible um and and i you know like i said i i definitely i agree with young and even plato that if, if this thing is inherited well why can't it be predictive um you know there there are certainly loads of movies out there um, that, that are prophetic. Um, you know, we're talking about the nine 11 ones. There are some other ones that I document in, in the, in the book. Uh, they're escaping me right now. I'm sorry, but they're not, they're more innocuous. Um, they're, they're not anything dealing mm -hmm. with nine 11 or anything. Uh, they're escaping me for the time being, but there are instances clearly where movies can be prophetic. I do not dispute that. Hmm. Um, there was something else I was going to ask you about and I forgot what it was. Uh, all right, let's, let's move on to one of the other ones. Uh, you see a lot of Gnostic imagery in this stuff. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, well, you know, when it comes to Gnosticism, um, there is, uh, definitely, you know, some movies that very, you know, have very heavy Gnostic overtones, you know, the false reality, the material world, the rebellion against materialism, the search for spiritual gnosis. Um, I think of movies, you know, such as the, the matrix. I mean, really, if you want to know the, the Gnostic religion, the Gnostic theology, the Matrix and the Truman Show, I mean, that's everything you, you clearly have. You have the false reality, the illusionary reality, yeah. uh, you know, created by the Demiurge, the, the, the sort of god of the material world. This would be the architect, of course, in the Matrix, and of course, Christoph in, in the Truman Show. You have Gnostic themes in, in Fight Club. 
the rebellion against the demiurge, you know, Tyler Durden, you know, we don't need him, you know, the complete rejection of materialism, the whole idea of sort of, you know, seeking spiritual gnosis for, through, through self-deconstruction, you know, in this, in, in Fight Club's case, you know, the, the destruction of the self, the physical and spiritual almost destruction of the self to, to identify spiritual gnosis. So, or to obtain spiritual gnosis. So, yeah, I mean, not Gnosticism is is definitely um, in vogue in Hollywood, and uh, you know, I, I, it, it's a term that sometimes I gets gets I think thrown around lo- loosely. Um, there are definitely movies that are definitely Gnostic in theme, no question. Such as you know, the Big Three. I would say are things like you know, the the Matrix, you know, Fight Club, The Truman Show, other other movies. Uh, I haven't seen in a while, but certainly Dark City. Mm. uh donnie darko uh vanilla sky those are all flirts with you know those are all gnostic movies one of the ones i know you wanted to ask me about and i would say i i I wouldn't i wouldn't categorize it as a gnostic film but i would definitely argue that it has gnostic undercurrents or a gnostic overtone certainly flirts with it is um this movie that came out in 1979 called the warriors yeah and i was kind of surprised to, to hear that i wouldn't have thought of them as uh, that as being anything really gnostic yeah on it on its surface no um and like i said i would not i would caution people i would not even say i say in the book i would not list this as a gnostic movie um but it definitely flirts with it um mm. and and what i mean to say is you know, I'll just get into it. I mean, I, I like the, I mean, there's definitely symbolism in this movie. Um, uh, it's a great movie anyway. Um, right. you know, I mean, it's by far and away probably in one of my, in my top 10 favorite movies of all time, no question about it, but it, it's this whole idea of, you know, the warriors, this, this, you know, gang going, well, I think, you know, they're from Coney Island. They go to the Bronx to have this, you know, the truces on the whole idea is they're, they're, they're going there with, um, to meet, you know, with these other gangs to listen to this guy named Cyrus, who who is in charge of this big New York game called the Gramercy Riffs. And what the whole the whole idea is, he's trying to unify all these gangs under one banner. Very interesting name to give Cyrus. Um, this is clearly mirroring a Persian emperor known as Cyrus the Great, who was trying to do this exact same thing. He was trying to unify all of Persia under one banner. So a very interesting name to give to this character. Um, Cyrus, who's trying to unify all the gangs under one banner. Of course, all hell breaks loose. The truce gets called off, and the warriors have to fight um, their way back through New York to get back to Coney Island, which is their turf, which is their home home turf. Mm-hmm. And along the way, they, they battle these other gangs. And of course, if you've seen the movie, you have the like, Turnball ACs. Of course, the one that everyone knows is the Baseball Furies. Um, you have the female gang uh, there, you know, the Lizzie's. You have the the one gang that is, you know, so low on the totem pole, no one even bothers with them, the orphans. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's this whole idea is they're they're fighting to get back to their turf. And it's as they go through this, they become wiser. Um, and especially the leader of the gang. Um, and of course, you know, as this is going on, this one gang called the Rogues is, you know, they're the ones who have actually killed Cyrus. They pin it on the warriors. So everyone's looking for the warriors. There's the one scene that's great where the rogue leader is talking on the phone. And I talked about this in the first book. I mean, to me, he's clearly talking to the devil. Um, who, who else could it be? He says, we're under protection. We're fine. Everyone's out looking for the warriors. Um, the warriors are fighting their way back. And as they do this, they sort of become enlightened. They become wiser. Um, they encounter the sacred feminine, um, which is the street urchin named Mercy. Great name to give to her as the sacred feminine. She's sort of the Sophia character. Um, they're, of course, warriors. They're warlike. She's benevolence and kindness, as her name suggests, mercy. So she is dualistically playing off of them. And she's helping them on this journey to get back to Coney Island. And I, I really like it where they finally get back to Coney Island and the sun is rising over the horizon. The sun bringing light, enlightenment, wisdom. And the, and the, the, the leader um, is standing there and he's just looking out over Coney Island. And I mean, it's just this dilapidated hellhole. And he says, you know, is this what we fought all night to get back to? And he does have this sort of Gnostic epiphany where he realizes that gang banging is no good. Materialism is no good. This gang life is, is going nowhere. You know, is he seeking spiritual gnosis? Probably not. But is he seeking something better? Yes. So I would definitely categorize it as this sort of epiphany, this wisdom Gnostic epiphany. And I, I love his name, um, Swan. I mean, if you're familiar with, uh, 
you know, the ancient mysteries, um, and you're familiar with the works of Manly P. Hall, um, the swan, the actual bird, was a symbol of an initiate into Gnosis, into the ancient mystery tradition. So and that's exactly what, what's going on. He, he goes to this nocturnal battle, um, this adventure, and he, he has this Gnostic epiphany um, where he realizes that gangbanging and, uh, you know, materialism is bogus. And he walks away from it at the end. And I, I would draw a parallel to something like uh, The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy Gale has this adventure and has her epiphany where she realizes that there's no place like home. Uh, I would also draw a parallel with something like Alice in Wonderland, same sort mm. of thing where it's the adventure in this sort of magical world. Um, you know, of course, the warriors take place in the real world, but it's the same thing. It's like a trial, a, tr a trial of, of, uh, of tests that these characters are put through. And right. they, have, they receive this Gnostic epiphany at the end. And this is clearly what's going on in, in, in the warriors. Like I said, I wouldn't call it a Gnostic film in the vein of The Matrix or, the, or Fight Club or The Truman Show, but it, it definitely flirts with Gnosticism and has some Gnostic undercurrents in it. And it's a great movie anyway, so if you haven't seen it, by all means, check it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think that was intentional, the Gnostic? Or do you think that was more unconscious? Uh, I think I think it's a little of both in, in that in instance. Um, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, I, th I think the idea of this guy having this adventure and having this revelation that this is no good, um, I definitely think that was intentional. I mean, I just, you know, it was one of these things that just it all fell into place. I mean, I just love it at the end where, you know, they're fighting in darkness and, and you know, it's nighttime and then the sun rises. And, of course, the sun, the symbol that brings light, you know, and, he's, and, and, and this is when he has his epiphany. I mean, I thought that was very well done cinematically. So, I, I, you know, Walter Hill is, is a very adroit filmmaker. So I do believe in, in, in that this was somewhat intentionally done. Um, and it, like I said, I, it has Gnostic undercurrents in it. And I definitely think it's intentionally placed. But if Walter Hill was ever interviewed and said, no, it's none of this I never intended, then I would craft the argument that this is a prime example of the collective unconscious being at work. Okay. And we're talking with Robert Sullivan about his new book, Cinema Symbolism 2, here on Where Did the Road Go? Um, let's, let's get into Crimson Peak. You were talking a little of light and dark imagery in that, and that was such a beautiful movie. Absolutely. Um, I, I really like Crimson Peak. Um, there is, um, yeah, there, there's some great, great symbolism in this. I mean, even when you're watching the commercials for, for this thing, um, you, you can see, see some, uh, you know, real symbolism just, just through that. I mean, you, you really have this interplay. Um, I mean, and this is done in other movies as well with light, darkness, heat, cold. Um, I mean, you, you, the whole movie starts out. Um, I mean, Crim Crimson Peak, let me just caveat all this with what I'm about to say. This is a very deep study. I mean, I, I could do a whole show on this thing. So I'm going to try to keep this, you know, relatively in bounds here. But okay. you have the whole, the whole idea of this you know, it's light versus darkness. I mean, this is, you have this going on in The Shining, you have this going on in The Exorcist. The whole movie opens in sunlight um, in Buffalo, New York. Um, you have the Mia Wazachowska character, um, Wazachowska character playing Edith Cushing. I mean, she's wearing the yellow clothing. She's clearly a solar allegory. She's sort of a solar heroine. Um, you know, you know, she, she, she wears, uh, she's in the park with the, uh, with the Jessica Chastain character. And she talks about how the, the butterflies, um, you know, are, are linked to the sun. And of course, you know, if you pay attention to this, when, when um, I mean, the butterfly constantly surrounds the Edith Cushing character. I mean, she wears the uh, butterfly hair brooch. She sits in the wingback chair in, in the mansion in, in Crimson Peak or Allardale Hall, which is the butterfly. Um, so you have this whole idea of her being the solar heroine. The first half of the movie takes place in, in the light of Buffalo, New York. Then she moves to um, the Allerdale Hall, and the last half of the movie is in darkness. And again, it's winter, cold, death of the sun. She's running around in, in, in the nightgown looking like a skeleton. She's in death. This is when the ghosts come out to play, and of course, she's in the weakened state. So you have this whole sort of neo-manichaeanism um, going on in, in Crimson Peak, light versus darkness. I mean, the whole idea is that the, the, um, that the house is a reflection of um, Lady Lucille. And, uh, you know, the, the other, the, the, the male figure, uh, Sir Thomas Sharp, you know, when, when, they're, when, when they're away from the home, the Jessica Chastain character, Lady Lucille is wearing the red dress, the crimson, she's taking the house symbolically with her. When they're in the house, they're wearing the teal colors, which is the wallpaper of the house. So the house is mirroring them and, that, and 
they're mirroring the house. Um, it's a great movie. Um, I'm not going to give this away um, too much, um, and and it's 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 I, I get into it very in depth in the book, and I don't I I, I present I presume some of this intent is intentional, some of it may not be, but uh, this movie Crimson Peak is an entire retelling of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, uh, the parallels between um, Crimson Peak and The Shining are astounding. Really? Um, oh yeah, it is. It is absolutely uncanny. Um, and it's something that I, I get into in the book. If you like The Shining, you're going to like Crimson Peak because they are all but frame by frame remakes of one another. Hmm. I, it didn't even occur to me to compare those two. There is a lot going on in this. I'm going to give you some examples in this, um, between the characters and, uh, you know, some of the scenery going on. I'm, I'm going to be reading this off a list. Um, so, you know, I don't want people to think I'm memor I've memorized this. <laughs> I, have, I have not. I'm reading this off a list. I'm going to give you some examples of this. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with Crimson Peak, and then I'm going to go to The Shining. So I'm going to start with Crimson Peak, and then I'm going to The Shining. Um, and like I said, I'm reading this off a list. This is in the book. I'm actually reading the text of the book. Um, this is some of the parallels between Crimson Peak and The Shining. This is really a symbolic goldmine. I mean, this is really, really a deep study here. I had to watch the movie several times. Well, the, the, the trigger incident for this was, by the way, was the scene in Crimson Peak where Edith goes into the green bathroom and the ghost comes up and uh, scares the hell out of her. And of course, this is completely mirroring The Shining, um, where Jack goes into the green bathroom and the ghost comes up hmm. and uh, scares him away. And I started thinking about it. I thought, wow, that really reminds me of The Shining. And I went back and started watching. I thought, oh, oh my God, uh, this movie really is almost a remake of The Shining. So here we go. I'm reading this. Um, I've not, not memorized this. So I'm going to start with Crimson Peak and go to The Shining. So here we go. Crimson Peak. A struggling writer, Edith Cushing, goes to an isolated haunted mansion with two people, Sir Thomas and Lady Lucille Sharp. Ghosts aside, they are the only three inhabitants of the mansion during the field. Uh, the Shining. A struggling writer, Jack Torrance, goes to an isolated hotel with two people, Wendy and Danny Torrance. Ghosts aside, they are the only three inhabitants of the hotel during the film. The name Edith Cushing has 12 letters. The name Jack Torrance has 12 letters. <laughs> Mia Wasikowska plays Edith Cushing. The name Mia Wasikowska has 13 letters. Jack Nicholson plays, portrays Jack Torrance. The name Jack Nicholson has 13 letters. While in Ogilvy's office, played by Jonathan Hyde, Edith tries to persuade him to publish her manuscript. While sitting in Allman's office, Jack tries to persuade him to hire him as the winter caretaker. Gruesome murders have occurred inside Allardale Hall. Ghastly murders have occurred inside the Overlook Hotel. Edith Cushing is tormented by ghosts. Jack Torrance is tormented by ghosts. Edith Cushing's wardrobe consists of golden yellow frocks and dresses. Jack Torrance drives a yellow Volkswagen Beetle. The estate's name, Allerdale Hall, has 13 letters. The resort's name, Overlook Hotel, has 13 letters. Allerdale Hall sits in, on a mountain in Cumberland, England. Overlook Hotel sits on a mountain in Colorado, United States. Edith Cushing attends a party with wealthy, aloof American elites, most of whom are superficial. Jack Torrance attends a party with wealthy, aloof American elites who happen to be ghosts. Edith Cushing is warned by the ghosts of her dead mother to beware of Crimson Peak. Danny Torrance is warned by his imaginary friend, Pony, Tony, to beware of the Overlook Hotel. Edith Cushing conspicuously uses a typewriter. Jack Torrance conspicuously uses a typewriter. Inside an opulent men's bathroom, Carter Cushing solicits the truth about Sir Thomas and Lady Lucille from Mr. Holly. Inside an opulent men's bathroom, Jack Torres solicits the truth about the Overlook Hotel and his son's extrasensory talents from Mr. Grady. The name Holly has five letters. The name Grady has five letters. Alan McMichael can see v ghosts via spirit photography. Dak Dick Halloran can see ghosts via the ability to shine. The name Alan McMichael has 13 letters. The name Dick Halloran has 13 letters. Um, so I have about another 50, of them, <laughs> um, but, but there's some of them for you. Um, and it goes on and on. Um, you know, we, I could sit here for another three hours, right? Reading you, uh, comparisons between these two movies. Wow. And that was done by Del Toro, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Um, Crimson Peak was D G Guillermo Del Toro. Believe me, I just scratched the surface with this. I'm um, sure. Of course, of course, I don't want to give it away. Read the book. But, and of course the shining was done by Stanley Kubrick. Um, and it's a fascinating study. It's, it's really one of the gems of Crimson Peak. And, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but of, of, uh, of, of uh, cinema symbolism, too, is this whole comparative study with, um, with Crimson Peak and The Shining. It, it's one of the pieces that I'm really most proud of. All right. Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about the shining. You talk a little bit about the uh, doubles and repetition in the shining to denote reincarnation and repeating cycles going on inside the hotel. That, that is absolutely correct. Um, in in the shining, um, you have this whole idea of the overlook of 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 uh, you know it's it's repetition. It's this vicious reincarnation cycle going on inside um, inside you know the overlook hotel. Everything is repeating itself. And, and this is what what Kubrick uses doubles, you know, a duplicate image um, to 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 really bombard your subconscious mind with this whole reincarnation. It's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious repetition cycle. Um, and, and he does it all over the place. Um, for instance, you have characters say lines back to each other. You have the, I mean, you have the right right off the bat. You I mean you have the whole you have doubles in this thing. I mean, you have two mazes. You have the overlook and the maze, the hedge maze outside. You know, a dark maze, man-made maze with a ghost roam, and then you have the protective, natural man-made maze outside. This is sort of the protective mandala of of Danny Torrance. You have the two twins. Um, you have um, the you know when when the two twins are introduced in the hotel, Allman is taking them to the room, and they and two twins walk by him. Um, two twin girls. He says, "You have a great you know winter, girls. I'll see you back here in the summer." Um, you have characters saying lines back to each other. Um, Danny sees the two twin girls, the Grady twins, and they say, stay with us here forever and ever. Then a few minutes later, Danny's sitting on the bed with the father, Jack Nicholson, Jack Torrance. And, uh, he says to, uh, he says to him, uh, you know, I want to stay here forever and ever. When, when Shelley Duvall and, uh, Danny are going into, um, the hedge maze for the first time. She says, keep America clean. And he said, repeats it right back, keep America clean. Um, so you have repetition. Um, you have it with numbers, for instance. Um, you have the number 237 of the hotel. If you add the number 237 up, you get the number 12. Um, 12 is a repetitive uh, device that repeats all over the, uh, all over the place. Um, you have Danny and, uh, Danny and Wendy taking 12 turns in the hedge maze. Uh, Jack throws the ball against the wall 12 times. He hits the door with the axe 12 times. The hotel is KDK 12. Um, two times are shown, eight and four. Add eight plus four to get the number 12. So you have uh, repetition with the number 12. Um, you have repetition with the number 42. Uh, Scatman Crothers drives a, a car with the license plate number 42. Uh, Danny Torrance at the beginning has the number 42 on his uh, T-shirt when he's talking to himself in the mirror. Um, the movie they're watching in the Overlook, uh, Danny and Wendy, is the summer of 42. Um, so this is a number. And of course, 237, if you add, if you multiply it, you get the number 42. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's repetition from start to finish. Um, he uses doubles, the twins. I mean, Jack, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Yeah. You know, you know, Jack Torrance, when he's sitting at the bar, has two tens and two twenties on him. Um, there's two, there's two, uh, what, what does he say? There's two uh, mains, Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Uh, that's mentioned twice. Um, he, he, you know, when he's driving to the hotel, he's, uh, I think he passes uh, four cars, two are stationary and two are moving. Um, so you have this entire, I document it much more in the book, but you have this entire vicious repetition cycle of repeating dumber, numbers, repeating doubles. And, and it's what, he, what Kubrick is really doing is blasting your subconscious mind with repetition. Um, and what he's trying to do is convey subconsciously this vicious reincarnation cycle going on inside the Overlook Hotel. Um, I get into it much more depth, depth in the book, but it's a very interesting st study. I love The Shining anyway, but um, I, it, it's a great movie to break down esoterically. A lot going on inside the thing. And of, and of course, none of that was meant by Stephen King. That was all Kubrick. Absolutely. Um, no question about it. Um, and if, in fact, I have a picture in the book of, um, of Kubrick's copy of the script, and he's actually scribbled down notes on it um, where he changed the hotel room number, and he, he writes down, you know, how... He, he was going to, the, the, the number um, uh, 237, um, he was going to do something with that, with the date, with, uh, with something um, where, where he had written down, you know, 2-3 re repeating itself or something. So, no, this was clearly intentionally done um, by Kubrick, no question about it. And what, what do you think of the uh, f popular theories that there was, there was uh, hints of landing. him faking the moon landing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's an interesting theory. I don't think I'm ready, ready to buy into that one just yet. Um, if, if the listeners are not aware, uh, probably many of them are, of course. The whole idea with this is um, that 
you know, you know, Kubrick after Strange Love and 2001 came out. The idea is that NASA, whether they went to the moon or not, is one thing. They could have gone to the moon, but they couldn't film there. So they filmed in a studio, the men, you know, kind of floating around. And Kubrick is the one who did this. This is what's alleged. And he gives us away in The Shining. Um, and the symbolism is when Danny Torrance stands up, it's a rocket launch. He's wearing the Apollo 11 sweatshirt. And, and clearly Kubrick changed the room number. I believe it's 217 in the book, excuse me, or 213 in the book. I can't recall. He, he changes it to 237 in the, in, in the movie, of course. And the, the reason for this is that in the late 1970s, the moon was 237,000 miles away from, from Earth. So, so Danny wearing the Apollo 11 sweatshirt is symbolically going to the moon. I'm not ready to buy into that yet. I'm, I'm not sure that's there. It's an interesting theory. Um, the, the little boy definitely stands up with authority. I, I don't dispute that. I mean, he's obviously wearing the Apollo 11 sweatshirt. So, you know, could it be? I guess it's possible. I guess for me personally, it's not anything I'm ready to buy into yet, though. But it could be. I'm open-minded. Well now, when you don't, if you don't want to buy into it, is that because you don't think there was a conspiracy about the moon, or you don't feel the evidence is strong enough that there was some symbolism meant there? Oh, I, it's it's the symbolism meant there. I mean, the the idea is they could have gone to. I'm not saying they faked the moon landing. the The theory is that the way I understand it is you can look at it. Well, you can look at this one of two ways. The theory is either they went to the moon, they really did go, but they couldn't film there. So mm -hmm. Kubrick, they just filmed the footage to make people happy. You know, it's just evidence that they went, but they actually did go. Or you could argue that they never went and the whole thing was staged. Um, you could fall into one of those two camps, or you could say they went and they filmed there. Um, and, that you know, this is just a giant conspiracy theory. I mean, you know, I think they probably went. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I really think they probably did go to the moon. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, could they have filmed the footage and say, okay, we can't film on the moon in the late 1960s and 1969. So we'll just stage it. And, you know, I mean, is it possible? Of course. Um, could Kubrick have done it? Of course. Could he be trying to tip people off to this in the shining? Absolutely. Um, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm open-minded to it. Uh, the other theory I've heard is that we didn't want to give away our technology to the Russians by showing it on film. So even though we went, we, you know, created a fake version of that for public consumption. And that's very possible. I mean, very, very possible. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, you know, we, I, I, I would not necessarily disagree with that. And th there's just so much stuff in The Shining. Now, you know, even if you take that out, it's ridiculous how much he, he snuck in there. Oh, I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, there, there is, there is a, there is a very deep study there. I mean, you have the repetition. For, for certain, you have um, this whole play that Kubrick does with um, the whole idea of the Overlook being the dark side of America, being the opulent dark side where it's being, you know, built on the Indian burial ground, just as the United States was founded on the Indian nations. Mm. So, you know, the Overlook buries them. Um, I mean, you know, uh, you know, what is it that Ullman says all the best people come here, the elites, the Hollywood stars, the presidents. So it's sort of the dark side of America. You will find this in... Um, the battle weapons uh, of the Torrances, where Wendy is wielding the baseball bat of the national pastime, and of course Jack is wielding the axe, symbolizing the tomahawk of the American Indians. So it's it's you know the America versus the Indians. Um, it, that that's going on inside of it. You you have a very deep. This is something I also talk about in cinema symbolism too. Um, you have a very deep alchemical storyline going on in this. Uh, an idea of transition of the self, where Jack Torrance starts off as sort of this failed writer, failed father figure, and he alchemically actually changes um, in, in the, in, in, through the movie and becomes a psychopath. Um, and when you pay attention to this, there are some very key alchemical symbols that, uh, I don't want to give it away, but there are some alchemical symbols, symbolism going on inside that movie as well, symbolizing transition of self. Um, and when you're familiar with alchemical symbols in film, you will, you will find these themes also in movies like Black Swan, where mm -hmm. Nina Sayers starts off as this sort of shy, timid, sexually frustrated ball ballerina and alchemically changes into this graceful, yet demonic bird-like creature and graceful ballerina at the end of it. Um, alchemy is something that movie makers are very familiar with, and the ones who do it do it very adroitly. It's very cleverly placed, and you'll, you'll find an veiled alchemical storyline going on in The Shining as well, um, you know, the Kubrick, Kubrick implants in there. Hmm. 
Uh, let, let, let's let's go into the the mono myth in Dune. Oh, sure, no problem there. Um, the the um the, the, the this was another of David Lynch's movies that I yeah. performed. And um, I take on four David Lynch movies inside Cinema Symbolism 2. I take on Dune, Blue Velvet, Lost Highway, which we've already talked about, and Mulholland Drive, which is also a deep study. I, I, would, definitely, I would definitely say to, to you and the listeners that by far and away, the breaking down of Lynch movies is by far and away, it's heavy lifting. I mean, it's by far and away the most arduous task. I mean, there's so much going on inside these things. Um, Dune is a, is, was a book written by Frank Herbert. And what, what Dune is, you have some esoteric symbolism in this, but you really, you know, the, the monomyth of James, James Campbell, or excuse me, Joseph Campbell, the, um, the whole idea of the hero's journey, the sacred adventure, the, the elements, you know, of supernatural aid, apotheosis, the meeting of the sacred feminine, what he calls meeting with the goddess. You know, you will find these over and over again in these Hollywood blockbusters such as Star Wars, The Matrix. You'll find them in uh, the, the Chronicle of Narnia. You'll find them in all the Harry Potter stories. Um, Dune, Frank Herbert's Dune, interpreted by David Lynch, is really one of the premier movies where you will see the monument. All of the elements are there. Um, they are all there on, on, on the screen. Um, you know, the whole idea of, you know, the supernatural, way, you know, the supernatural aid being the weirding way. You have the whole idea of Paul, Paul Atreides being plucked, you know, and, and going on this messianic quest. I mean, that's really what he is. I mean, he winds up as really the savior figure. Um, you know, of Dune. I mean, he performs the miracle at the end where, the, where it starts raining, even more so than characters like Harry Potter and Luke Skywalker. So what I did, what I did in, in Cinema Symbolism 2 is I broke down uh, the Dune movie based on Campbell's monomyth because in my estimation, it's really the prime movie um, to witness the monomyth in. Um, there's some also esoteric imagery going on inside uh, Dune. I get into that as well. But if you're interested in the monomyth and the Joseph Campbell interpretation, and of course, if you're familiar with my work, you know I, I do this for other movies such as Star Wars, The Matrix, Lord of the Rings. I do this also in, with Dune in Cinema Symbolism too, and I also do this with um, uh, uh, you know movies such as the Harry Potter films and Chronicle of Narnia as well. You'll find the monomyth uh, elements completely alive and well in those films as well. Hmm. Okay. Um... Let's do one more. Let's let's deal with the alchemy, chaos, magic, and Freemasonry that you find in From Hell. Mm, absolutely. Um, this is this is a great movie. Um, and 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 what you have going on inside From Hell, um, you, I, I get into it really in depth in, in in the book. But I'll go over. You know, I'll just scratch the surface with this. What what the Jack the Ripper character is doing in in that movie is a form of chaos magic. Um, and what he's doing is he's fusing these Masonic rituals with actual murder. And what, what he's trying to do is he, it's a form of alchemy because what he's trying to do is he's using it's, it's, it's chaos magic, but he's trying to transmute something. What is he trying to transmute? Um, he's trying to transmute the 20th century and make it negative. And of course he ultimately succeeds in this. And this is what he tells you his modus operandi is. He says, one day men will look back and say, I gave birth to the 20th century. What he's doing is the Ripper murders are Masonic rituals being reenacted but they're magic. Um, uh, you know, the, it's, it's a fusion of murder with ritual. It's a formulation of chaos magic to produce an alchemical transition, which is the transmutation in a negative way of the 20th century. If you want to see this in another movie, the parallel that I would draw is uh, the Excalibur movie, uh, John Borman's Excalibur. Mm. This is the same thing going on at the beginning of this movie, where Merlin the magician uses magic to summon the dragon's breath. Uh, sort of this philosopher's stone. Um, and what he does is he uses alchemy as well. He transmutes the semblance of the Duke to make him look like Uther Pendragon so that he can go in and have sex with Igraine to transmute the future. So she'll give birth to King Arthur, who will unify the land. And he even says it. He says, the future has taken root in the present. It is done. Um, and this is exactly the same thing that Jack the Ripper is doing in From Hell. The future is taking root in the present. He's using Masonic ritual and, 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 and murder as a form of his personal chaos magic to successfully perform alchemical transmutation, and that is to negatively create the 20th century. Fascinating alchemical study. Again, a lot of symbols of alchemy um, are, are, are present in From Hell, and uh, you know I'm scratching the surface. Uh, get in, if you want more information, get into it with the book. 
very fascinating study. I do three Alan Moore movies. Um, he's uh, very his movies and novels or comics are very occult, very gnostic, very alchemical. I break down from hell, uh, V for Vendetta and Watchmen. Um, that it's a whole mm. chapter in cinema symbolism too. Wow. So what what is the next project you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. I'm actually writing right now my first work of fiction. Oh. Uh, it, yeah, it's titled A Pact with the Devil. And um, I'm glad you asked me about this. Thank you. I would say it's about 70% done right now. It's total fiction. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it, it involves conspiracy. It involves witchcraft. It involves the Illuminati, Freemasonry, conspiracy, murder. Uh, it's erotic. It's got, a cry, it's got a crime mystery in it. Um, I'm really liking the way it's turning out. Um, like I said, I'm writing that right now. Uh, I'm probably about 70% done with this. Um, the idea for this actually came to me in a dream. I, I actually dreamt this oh. entire uh, story uh, when I was asleep. The dream occurred back in April of 2013. I remember waking up. I wrote it down. I made extensive uh, n notes about it. And um, I liked it. I, I liked the story. And uh, I started writing it. And like I said, I'm about 70% done. And uh, of course, over the years, you know, since I've been writing it, I, of course, Googled and to see if any thing like this had happened to anyone else where they dreamt it. And I found out that Mary Shelley had dreamt Frankenstein and Robert Louis Stevenson had dreamt Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and that H.P. Uh, Lovecraft had dreamt some of the mythology of the Necronomicon. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with it. I mean, I make no promises. I make no guarantees. But uh, that's my next project. Uh, working on that now, I'm doing everything I can to try to get that out before the end of the year. And, and I'm sure you've encoded a lot of stuff into it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but, uh, we'll see what I can do about that. <laughs> All right. Where can people find you online? Yeah. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me on Absolutely. where Did the road go. I really appreciate it. I thought the show was tremendous. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. To find me and to find my books, um, Royal Arch of Enoch, Cinema Symbolism, and of course, my latest book, Cinema Symbolism 2, they're available now on all major online retailers. Just go to my website. My name is Robert W. Sullivan IV. My website is just that. It's www.robertwsullivaniv.com. That's Robert W. Sullivan, the letter I, the letter V, dot, dot com for the fourth, Robert W. Sullivan, IV dot com. Sullivan with two L's. From there, you can read about me. You can find out about other Shows I've done, there's links to my social media, Twitter, YouTube channel, where you can listen to other radio shows and podcasts I've done. That content is all free. Um, you can, uh, of course, links to buy the books. Um, they're in print edition. They're in the ebooks, Amazon Kindle, places like Kobo, ebook mall, um, you know, bookshop. You can get the print edition. The ebooks are obviously much cheaper. Barnes and Noble, as of recording this, is the site is down, but it is on Nook, I suppose, when it ever comes back up. But yeah, just go to my website, robertwsullivaniv.com. Uh, very easy to navigate. Links to buy the book, links about upcoming shows I'm doing, information about me, and links to all my social media, www.robertwsullivaniv.com. All right. Thank you so much, Robert. Oh, thank you again for having me on. Much appreciated.